Do we have it now? No. <laughs> that enables a lot of researchers to have their salary paid. Meet all cognitive radio, which are the main characteristics. Multi-standard, that was his goal. We need to have multiple standards in the same device that is able to you know, connect to the best opportunity. Here we were talking about, for example, GSM and CDMA 2000. Uh, is, that, is that, in that case, more kind of a software radio? Exactly. Because actually the concept that he introduced, it's more related to, to kind of uh, uh, software radio, so basically you just try to operate in a different kind of uh, technologies, so yes. uh, there is no any cognitivity there. Not really. That was the basic starting point, because if you look at Mitlow's paper, there is something extremely specific, which is terminal-centric. He was talking always about a PDA, and it is user-oriented, so the cognitivity is mostly not in the radio itself. It's mostly in how the terminal deals with the user needs. As you can, there will be, a, I will show you the funny uh, the presentation of what it is in the paper. But uh, he thinks mostly about detecting the environment with multiple sensors, like you know, voice and video processing and so on. I remember one of his speeches at Software Defined Radio Conference in Orlando 2006. He was actually showing a video of someone mounting a video camera on the, on the glasses in order to, to have the radio being able to detect what the user was, to, was trying to do and show him how to process the video. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, the idea was to use the radio to enhance the user experience. But the radio is just one of the tools, not the only one. The other tools are mostly software, how to optimize the calendar, or how to optimize the, prof the sound profile, the ringtone profile of the, of the terminal. And that's what, what it is his cognitive cycle. So, as you can see, if you look carefully, there is basically nothing related specifically to the radio. That's more an artificial intelligence uh, diagram. Because he was a software guy, so he was not caring too much about you know, the specific detail of the radio channel. He was caring about the user experience from a software point of view. This is an artificial intelligence state diagram, basically. Aiken's vision is a bit more poetic. He goes really down into what the radio is supposed to do. Uh, for time reason, because I want to show you also something more interesting uh, for today, I will skip some slides like this one, and I will just talk about it in these terms. That's the Simon Aiken's cognitive cycle. As you can see, he talks about the radio environment. He talks about the RF stimuli, radio scene analysis, spectrum walls, noise flow statistics. And that's what Simon Aikin sees in his vision. He talks about you know, interference analysis, channel state information, uh, adaptive signal transmission in power control, MIMO, turbo processing. That's a radio gun. That's the vision I followed basically all along my PhD because that was a radio, it was not only a general artificial intelligence. Going into scenarios, something practical, that's the middle of scenario I was trying to tell you about. So we have some guy that, you know, I added these arrives in a kind of airport, and according to the country, the radio, okay, we have this country, over the air, I download the proper software, and I reconfigure to be able to connect. And then the guy jumps on the taxi and gives the address, and speech recognition detects destination address, computes all these type routes and maps and so on, and it starts informing you know, all the cells all along the path of the taxi. 
that there will be an endover and in order to optimize the connection until the destination address. That was Mito's vision. That was a real smart terminal that it was sensing the entire world. Uh, I remember one paper, I read one paper once, but unfortunately I don't remember which one, where there was someone suggesting that the terminal that was called something like John uh, was dropped somehow on the floor and uh, it recognized by the sound where he was and he started calling the other, uh, you know, uh, phone, fixed phones of the guy where, where the, the phone was so the guy could pick it up. So, to, 2000, that was the cognitive radio we had at the time. <coughs> but today, a very, very hot topic, and some one of you probably knows about it, it's the wireless regional area network on TV white space. White space is the specific name it has been given to these type of spectrum holes. So, and that's because, first of all, let's talk about US. In US, the TV channels over the air are not so overused as in Europe. So there is a bit more space already because cable is, has just bigger diffusion. Uh, and the problem that they had is that there are rural areas where it's not that it's impossible to provide internet to the rural areas, it's that from an operator point of view, it's extremely costly. And the revenue for it is not that high. So it, you'd have no break even, basically. <coughs> so what they decided to do is said, okay, we have this opportunity. TV, the TV channels have an extremely good coverage. And they are not used because either you know, they were allocated 20 years ago, but now there is the cable. And or there are some local or regional broadcasters that do not use the channel all the time. Because, you know, those small TV, small TV stations where they have, I don't know, 6, 8, 12 hours of transmission a day. So I said, okay, now, now let's do it and let's try to transmit. This picture has been taken from a European project because also here in Europe we are sensitive to this type of technology. A project called Cosmos. And they have several types of usage of TV white spaces. This is the most, let me say, famous, but someone is also thinking about extremely low power communication in TV white space in the indoor. And, you know, in the beginning, the main intention was wow, we have spectrum sensing, we are smart, we detect the holes with the spectrum sensing, and we decide to transmit. But unfortunately, someone at the you know, FCC decided to tell them that probably was not, not the case. And we'll discuss about it. And then <coughs> there was, in, uh, in Antipoli, a big push in a certain moment because they said, okay, now we have a solution. Deve let's develop a standard. And the V standard was the 802.22, which was the first Cognitive Wireless Radio Area Network standard. Wow, it sounds fantastic. Since they needed to do something pretty quick, because they felt that there was a huge need, what they did, they took what they had from the 802 standards, and in specific the 11 and the 16. So they borrowed concept from WiMAX and Wi-Fi, and they made this uh, this new standard, where this is, for example, this is a very nice paper about the standard on the uh, i communication magazine, where they compare the, the different standards in terms of data rate and in terms of um, <coughs> spectrum and capabilities and so on. And if you look here, for example, in this table where you define the air interface, it's really, really similar uh, to WiMAX. Uh, with the only you know, um, difference that you, you have a special frame that allows uh, dynamic spectrum sharing. 
which was substantially contention based. Uh, because this frame, again, you, there is no comparison in the paper, but let me tell you that this is basically a very, very similar to a WiMAX frame. Uh, there are some uh, parts of the frame which are muted uh, where they allow the newcomers or the neighboring networks to exchange beacons and so on in order to see who are the neighbors and to allow newcomers to enter the network. <coughs> and everything is very simple because it's based on a, on a scheduling map which is transmitted right after the preamble uh, for the following frame. That's very, very simple technology. The modern scenarios are that, as I said, FCC was not that happy about the spectrum sensing base because